Fossils are among the most valuable source of information about Earth's history. They tell us about the organisms that lived on Earth from the time of the oldest fossils, about 3.8 billion years ago, to the present. By studying fossils, we can learn a lot not only about the creatures and plants of distant past, but how they grew, what they ate, how they in interacted, and many other aspects of behavior. Fossils reveal many fascinating facts about the past, but they do a lot more. Information about Earth's history, practical help in finding energy resources, and information that helps us anticipate the effects of possible environmental changes are not only the benefits derived from fossils. Fossils are beautiful. Many of thousands of peoples collect, buy, sell, and trade fossils all over the world. Many people collect fossils simply because they are beautiful, but others do so because fossils tell us fascinating stories. Neither Barney the Dinosaur nor Jurassic Park would exist if there was no fossils. A fossil is the remains or traces of an organism preserved from the geologic past. Today we're going to talk about the different types of fossils. Each type forms in a different way. Firstly, petrified fossils. Petrified literally means turned to stone. When organisms or plants get turned to stone, minerals soak into the pores of the dead organism. So this tree would have died. It gets very quickly so that um, decomposing organisms cannot eat it away. And then when it rains, the minerals will dissolve and soak into the pores. As it's dried out, the water precipitates out and the minerals crystallize to form a fossil. Here we have petrified wood, a petrified dragonfly, and an ancient petrified sea creature. Fossils can also form from moles. A mold is a shell or other structure that gets buried in sediment and then dissolved underground by water. It reflects only the shape and surface markings of the organism. So the organism is not actually fossilized, it's just the shape. Here we've got a mold of a seashell, a fish, and the ancient index fossil, a trilobite, which we'll talk about later. From a mold, we can get a different type of fossil, which is called a cast. So a cast happens or is created by empty spaces of a mold that later get filled with matter. Up here, our trilobite mold got filled with sediment and has made a cast. We have a cast of an octopus looking structure here and then a fish. Another type of fossil is a carbon film. Fossils called carbon films can preserve delicate details of leaves and animal parts. The formation of carbon film begins when an organism is buried under fine sediment. Over time, pressure squeezes out liquid and gases and leaves behind a thin film of carbon. These carbon film fossils are useful to scientists because they often preserve the very fine details that we couldn't see in other types of fossils. Preserved remains happens when the whole animal gets fossilized. There are several different ways that we can get preserved remains. Firstly, freezing. This is the baby woolly mammoth that they found. Um, cold temperatures freeze the animal. It's so cold that bacteria can't get in, so the animal does not get decomposed. Another type of complete preserved remains is fossils in amber or hardened tree sap. Here we see a scorpion and perhaps mosquito that's been got caught in some tree sap. Tree sap. The tree sap hardened and turned to amber, and we get to see the whole creature. Fossils in amber are very useful to scientists because they can see the entire structure of the organism and it preserves even the tiniest details like these little legs right down here. Tar pits are also another way that the entire animal can get preserved. If you've ever been to California and stopped by the La Brea tar pits pictured right here, this is not a real fossil. Um, animals will get stuck in the tar pits and then they die. So in these tar pits, they can pull out the entire skeletons of ancient creatures. And lastly, mummification, which happens in hot, dry climates. Much like Egyptians mummified their kings and stuff, animals can get preserved in hot, dry climates and create fossils. Here we have a fossilized cat, likely from Egypt. And if this fish were to be buried in sediments so that it could not get decomposed by bacteria, it would also create a fossil. Trace fossils are indirect evidence of prehistoric life. 
tracks like these seen here give us evidence of how animals moved. They are animal footprints made of soft sediment that is later changed into sedimentary rock. Oftentimes tracks get washed away by weathering. Burrows are another type of trace fossil. Burrows are holes made by animal in sediment, wood, or rock that were later filled with mineral matter and preserved. Some of the oldest known fossils are believed to be worm burrows. These both would be examples of burrows. Coprolites are fossils of dung and stomach contents. These can provide useful information regarding the food habits of an organism. Here we have two beautiful examples of fossilized dung. And lastly, gastroliths. Gastroliths are highly polished stomach stones that were used in the grinding of food by some extinct reptiles. So sometimes reptiles would have these stones in their stomachs. You can see them right here. This is what they'd look like up close to help them grind their food and digest it. All the fossils that geologists have found arranged by their relative age make up the fossil record. But the fossil record includes only a fraction of the different kinds of organisms that lived on Earth. Not all organisms are preserved. They must have two distinct characteristics to become fossilized. One, they must be buried quickly by sediment. Um, sediments protect the soft parts of a dead animal from being eaten by scavengers or decomposed by bacteria. So this fossilized fish right here gets quickly buried by sediment and keeps out all the bacteria that would eat it away. Additionally, it must have hard parts. Organisms have a better chance of being preserved if they have hard parts such as shells, bones, or teeth. Fossils of hard parts are more common than fossils of soft-bodied animals. As we can see from this fish right here, its soft parts, its places without bones, is less likely to be preserved when we get left with the skeleton. How do scientists interpret the fossil record? To interpret the fossil record, we use two different um, principles, the principle of fossil succession and the theory of evolution. The principle of fossil succession states that fossil organisms succeed one another in a definite and determinable order. Um, this means that fossils weren't randomly distributed through rock layers. Instead, each layer contained a distinct assortment of fossils and they did not occur in the layers above or below it. So we could relatively date the fossils based on the principles of original horizontality and the principle of superposition. And then the other um, principle that we use is the theory of evolution. The theory of evolution says that life has changed over time from simpler to more complex means. So with this theory, scientists can determine the simpler organisms must be older. Here's a picture of our geologic time scale. So based on the theory of um, fossil succession, we know that if we find these fossils down here, they're from the late Paleozoic stage. Likewise, if we find fossils of flying birds and dinosaurs, we know it's from the Jurassic phase. Using the theory of evolution, these simpler fossils would be older than these more complex ones. Fossils in correlation. Um, scientists use index fossils to correlate layers. So much like this geologic time scale right here, we have index fossils all pictured here, and they know the definite ages of these index fossils via radiometric dating and the law of superposition. So they know that if they find this fossil right here, the Bathyrus, it's from this period or the Paleozoic era. These fossils are distributed widely throughout the entire Earth. Um, so they can correlate the layers of rocks based on the fossils that are found. An index fossil is a fossil that is widespread, abundant, and lived for a short period of geologic time. Um, index fossils are useful because since they lived for a short period of geologic time, scientists can estimate how old the rock layers are. So for example, in this picture down here, these two rock layers may be on different sides of the earth. But since they found the fossil 3 in this layer and this layer, 
they know that these two layers are of the approximate same age. Same goes for four. And then if we look at six right here, we can see that this fossil and this fossil are in these two rock layers, meaning that over here, something in the geologic time sale stopped deposition of rock layers to leave a gap for five. So it helps us give a relative age dating to the rock scale. Because rock layers do not always contain specific index fossils, geologists can use groups of fossils to establish the relative age of rocks. This is shown in these pictures. Um, so let's look at rock layer B here. We know that the age of this yellow one goes from here to here, so that's not a great one. The red one goes from here to here, so we know it must be in this age range. Um, and then we've got this one, which goes all the way through, this one, which goes all the way through, the blue one. So we're narrowing down the age of the rock to this tiny red layer. Same thing goes for the yellow layer. They've highlighted it right here. Because of these three fossils, the crab, the little red one, and the big red one, and the same thing goes for these down here. Fossils can also be used to reconstruct past environments. This seashell right here um, is actually the state fossil of Kentucky, located right here. So because we find this fossilized seashell in limestone, we know that Kentucky once was probably a shallow coastline covered by water. Um, we know it was probably a shoreline because this brachiopod fossil right here has a hard shell. So as the waves were crashing in, the fossil would have, or the organism would have survived. We can use evidence from teeth. This flat tooth right here is from the Stegosaurus, pictured right here. Um, the Stegosaurus is actually the state fossil of Colorado, where we are. Um, flat teeth indicates that the Stegosaurus used to eat plants. So that says that Colorado was once a luscious green environment. Another type of evidence we can use to reconstruct past climates is coral. Um, these are all pictures of fossilized coral that were found in Florida. Although Florida is near the coastline, um, you would not see coral growing there today, which means that Florida at some part was part of a tropical ocean underneath the water. So fossils help us reconstruct or know about the past environments. That concludes our notes for today. If you're using the guidance notes sheet, please answer these four questions following your notes. If you're completing your own notes, please write a conclusion and answer the following questions. One, list the different types of fossils. Two, describe the conditions that favor the formation of fossils. Three, describe two ways geologists can use fossils to interpret Earth's history. And four, and then an analysis of some sedimentary rocks suggests that the environment was close to the shoreline where high energy waves hit the shore. Corals and shelled organisms lived here. Describe what their fossils might be like.